Hello everyone. You are about to watch an incredible interview and we are on vacation this week. Yes. So you can see the beach here behind us, yes. some people in the pool. Um, but we're excited because uh, Chris Keel, who is our COO of Restore 7, has um, a good friend that he's interviewing from the ministry called I Empathize. And uh, it's just a great um, next step in us growing and understanding a little bit more of, of the issue of human trafficking in our generation. And this is specifically uh, in our nation that, um, that this interview is, is talking about. Yeah, and specifically, it really is almost a riveting interview. You know, it may take, I don't know, the first 10, 15 minutes just lays out some foundation of, of, of where he comes from. And uh, the kind of his philosophy behind it, yeah. Yeah, and then when he goes into how they're reaching out and how the, how it works, it really is uh, it is educational, uh, riveting, and I think you'll find uh, find it very it's very encouraging, very challenging. But you'll be really glad that that you were able to um, hear this one. So we wanted to be put a plug in personally because of that. That it really is a very uh, very special um, interview. interview. Yeah. Yep, enjoy super easy um and and i don't know if you want to talk about our connection at all yeah uh, in want, this just kind of okay like, okay okay and then cool. just kind of um you know i'll start just throwing stuff at you <laughs> okay awesome there. so um so guys today we're gonna bring a really awesome guy named brad who runs an organization called i empathize um brad are you from colorado actually brad are you no, I'm from Tulsa, Oklahoma, but uh, spent yeah. a lot of time in, in, in Colorado in as Colorado, well, yeah. my grown-up so, time. Okay. So Brad and I met, dude, it's probably been about a decade ago now. Um, well, yeah. And so we, I met Brad, I'd never met, we met at the airport actually, and he needed someone to help film um, for some footage that was down in Chiapas, Mexico, which still to this day, dude, was one of the craziest experiences that I've ever had, um, both just like and how it impacted me, but also just like, that was, that was something out of like the wild, wild west. <laughs> and so we went down to Chiapas and like the second night we were there, we, we joined a group of like, what was it, 150, 200 policemen who were doing human trafficking raids in the jungle um, at this, this hotel um, or whatever, whatever you would call that. Um, and just that whole experience, it was so profound for me and it was heartbreaking and just, I don't know, it opened my eyes to a whole different thing. But Brad, you led this whole experience. And so that's still to this day is one of like, and I've done a lot of crazy things, dude. That's, that's like one of the most <laughs> wild things that I've had, had a chance to experience. So um, well, it, it, what we did was so dangerous and you, you know, you're single and, and like everyone else that I'd ever worked with before you kind of had a spouse or kids and it was like their spouses and their kids, they were just like, go on this shoot and you were the only one crazy and brave enough to do it man <laughs> I would totally do it again dude that was like I mean I was like this is the kind of stuff that I feel like made for but it was amazing dude and I you know I remember um one of the things that still sticks out to me to this day dude was the when we were at those um you know the facility where the raid happened at how each one of those rooms was done in like a Disney character motif yeah you know? and how just yeah. heartbreaking it was um it just felt like so surreal, dude. I mean, you're, you're with like 200 Mexican police who are all wearing masks. You know, I mean, it's like they're not even being honest with each other about when the raid's going to happen because they don't know who's paid off, who's going to warn people that were coming. I mean, this whole like scenario. And then we get to this, you know, we get to this building and every room is just like, dude, it looks like a seven years old. It was just, it was just like, I remember just going outside just crying, dude. Like I was just not prepared to see like that level of intensity about it. But I just... I don't know. I mean, I was really moved by your work. And so I'm really, I would love for you just to tell, um, you know, tell our audience, what is I Empathize? You know, what do you guys, how did, what's the genesis of it? You guys, how long have you guys been around for at this point? Well, we, you know, we kind of been around for officially for, you know, just 11 or so years as a nonprofit, but there was a lot of ramp up that kind of led to us even, you know, creating I Empathize and, and making that the vehicle that we would combat the issues of exploitation that we all deal with, which obviously is issues like human trafficking. 
you know, our focus is, is, is completely on, you know, the vulnerabilities and victimization of, of children and youth. Okay. And so there's a spectrum of exploitation that young people experience and it contextualizes into their neighborhoods and their communities in, in slightly different ways. Uh, but there's some transcending things that are out there that, that cause exploitation to happen in vulnerable populations. And, you know, in, in, in our book, you know, the most vulnerable among us are, are those who cannot protect themselves or those that should have protectors in their lives, like their families and their parents. And for whatever reason, those protect, protective mechanisms and relationships are dismantled or pulled away. You know, whatever that might be, it just creates these spaces where young people um, can be taken advantage of in horrific ways. And so, you know, our focus is, is broad in that sense, but it's really drilled down to, to that particular audience. Our mission statement is uh, that we equip adults to empower youth to stay safe from exploitation. Okay. So, you know, it's not that we just have to have programs and messages that are directly impacting kids themselves. It, our, our, our ultimate strategy is to acknowledge that there are certain adults in certain zip codes, in certain career paths that intersect this issue and intersect youth. And we need to empower those young people and those adults to be able to work together so that those kids can be safe. Sometimes that's identifying that human trafficking is happening, like what we do with the trucking industry yeah. when we, we work with truckers against trafficking. Sometimes it's with a school teacher. Sometimes it's a social worker. But in different ways, we as adults, we see things happening in kids' lives based on our, our, our role and relationship yeah. with them, yeah. either, either in our home spaces or our workspaces. And so that's a big part of our strategy. Okay. So where did the name come from? Yeah. Yeah. The name is interesting. People are like, what's this idea of like the nexus yeah. of empathy and exploitation? How does that even work together? And, you know, I, I grew up uh, in Southern evangelical church. Okay. Uh, I grew up with a context of, of, you know, those that are suffering around us, that that's who you should be looking at and paying attention to. There's a, a scripture that I remember growing up that I really loved out of Hebrews that was, you know, that, that, that we, we don't have a high priest. And I think that was obviously referring to Jesus, who, who uh, is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but in, in all of our ways has suffered with us, you know, yeah. in essence. Totally. And, totally. And, and it was really, you know, those principles growing up and my mom cultivating those principles in me. Uh, I think empathy was always a really driving factor yeah. in the way that I expressed my faith. And as I grew up and, and, and all of that evolved and my thoughts on all that evolved, you know, when you mine the gold out of, out of your past, mm -hmm. there are certain truths in your life that really stand out. And for whatever reason that, that, you know, and part of that, I think is I have an empathetic, uh, kind of uh, a mantle or calling on my life or gift on my life, however you you know, however yep. you as an audience would would perceive that, totally. and and that's very important to me. And I'll give you this kind of quick idea of how we talk about this. And it's it, there really is a lot of sociological kind of um, concepts behind our approach. What we would say is most of the world is sympathetic to the suffering that's out there. Most of the world says, when I hear of something horrible happening to another human or group of people, I hate that it's happening to them. I, I, I hate to see people suffer. Right. But sometimes that suffering so intense that we kind of pull away from it and disengage. And even though we, we, even though we, we, we inside are not okay with it, mm -hmm. there's a lot of reasons why we can't cross over the bridge to actually deal with the problem. Sometimes it's just so big, we go, I'm, I, it's out of my league. Yeah. Sometimes we go, you know, I can't make a difference. I'm just one person. And so we don't know how to step over and engage. So yeah. we would say sympathy is, is feeling badly for the suffering of others, but not necessarily knowing how to do something about it. Mm -hmm. Apathy is a small group of, of people in our world who actually have disregard 
for yeah. those that are suffering. They separate themselves from that in a way that they either don't care about it and just allow it to continue to exist and it never gets addressed, mm-hmm. or they, it, it, it feeds them in criminal activity. They feel like, oh, well, I can then take advantage of vulnerable people right. and maybe for my own gain. And that's really the definition of exploitation. It's someone with some kind of power exercising that power over another human or people group. And they're able to take that exploitation and it benefits them at the expense of the people that they're exploiting. And you have to really be kind of an apathetic society or an apathetic person to be okay with that kind of stuff. Empathy is altogether different, Chris. You know, it really is this thing where it's like, I not only hate this injustice and despise this criminal activity that's happening to these people or to this person, but I'm going to figure out a way to step in. And I know compassion is a way that we think about that sometimes where we go, okay, I'm going to help. But a lot of times compassion is on our terms. We see a need and then we want to make an action, but we're not necessarily inviting the people who are, who are going through the suffering to the table and, and we're offering them help but they're not a part of the answer and the solution. Yeah. And, I, and the way we would describe empathy is that, that everybody comes to the table, the person who's going through the problem, the person who wants to help solve the problem, we get those people to the table together, and there we start to come up with a contextualized answer. And so when you do that, you start to see a shift in culture yeah. and you see a change. And it's really, you can't relegate these issues to cops or to, to juvenile justice systems or to, yeah. to laws. You can't relegate it to that. You have to, because it's a cultural problem and not just a criminal problem, yeah. you have to mobilize the community. And empathy is about mobilizing a community to change the way they view those things and how they engage them. That's really interesting. Let's talk about that for a second. So I, you know, I've never thought about it in that, in that context before. How, so how, how can we view human trafficking or this exploitation as a cultural problem? Um, yeah. What does that yeah. look like? What does that mean? I mean, I because I think to me it feels like it's one of the most like politically broad issues. Like everyone hates, like you know, I mean, at least in in voice they hate the idea of human trafficking. You know, it's it's like you don't really meet people who are who are okay with it, right? right. You know, so how does that? What does that mean exactly? Like, help me understand like what that looks like because that's really interesting to me. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think there's a lot, there's, it's multi-layered, you know, and I think we, we, could, we could study and learn why this is happening for a long time, and we need to, and we need to understand, understand each other to be able yeah. to get there. Um, you know, th- there's all kinds of reasons why it's happening. So, it, it, you know, first of all, there's a group of people who will exist and will always exist to take advantage of others. They're just going to be a part of our societies. Right. And we, we know that because we've seen that for hundreds and hundreds of years and generation after generation, it's a modern day manifestation, no matter what generation you're in, in your modern time of existence, yeah. there's going to be those folks in our society. Totally. So when we talk about this, we say, look, there's a lot of push factors out there that make people vulnerable. Um, and, and some of those are big, broad issues like racism. Mm. When we have racism involved towards a people group, um, those people then are, are marginalized. And the people who are, who, who are viewing themselves as superior to the other, you know, to those that are experiencing the racism, there is a, 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 a disassociation mm-hmm. of their humanity to mm-hmm. be able to do that. Totally. And they're less than. And we see that, you know, generationally, you know, from men to women. Mm -hmm. We see that in the way that we view uh, any kind of group that's out there that's different than ourselves. When we're the mainstream group, you know, somebody's different than ourselves, uh, there's this gap that's created. And we come to all these kind of conclusions about why and how they're different. And so so I, I think you could take a look at a lot of different reasons why that stuff happens. But ultimately, uh, even though, even if it's not just racism, it could be something else that's out there. It could be a natural disaster mm-hmm. where protective mechanisms are in place that keep a community safe and keep criminals uh, fettered 
and they're and they have you know that they, they have to really work hard to be a criminal and then there are other communities where we don't pay attention to them and sometimes when you get a natural disaster or like a pandemic a lot of our normal systems that protect a young person like just yeah. them going to school every day might be the safest place that they could be yeah. it just creates an atmosphere where those who want to be exploit to, to exploit someone who want to do that it's then they're able to to do that because the systems that keep it from happening are totally decimated so there's a lot of examples war yeah, that's interesting that's good uh, that's really good. So tell me this, dude, what, like, what was your, your personal story where you were like, Hey, like, what was your come to the kind of the crossroads situation that said, I want to give, I want to give my life to this, to this issue. I mean, you've been in this for many years. Yeah. Can you just share a little bit about what kind of brought you to this place. Well, I, I mean, we, we need to rewind to when I was a young musician in my twenties Yeah. and I, my, you know, I grew up with a very uh, clear, context of uh, you know that i want to make a difference in the world that i i want to help people who who are in a situation where they can't help themselves i want to create a megaphone and a platform for those who don't have a voice that is being listened to 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 their voice being heard yeah and and so you know i kind of always had that in my framework just you know thanks to my mom and thanks to my dad um and so i was kind of lucky that way yeah. But that, you know, it's also their fault that I have a nonprofit habit now <laughs> because, you know, when I, when I was a young musician, I was, a, I was, I was a jazz and blues artist. Um, that was kind of my R and B. That was my style. And I found myself playing in a lot of urban contexts. And I had a friend of mine who was a drummer uh, and, and we had connected on several different uh, projects. Mm -hmm. And he said, Hey, I have been mentoring a lot of young gang members through music and through spoken word. I help, I, I help them express themselves, find words for their life, wow. uh, be able to communicate. And then, and then I give them studio time. And if they stay in school or, you know, they do well on probation, you know, I keep rewarding them and you're in your twenties and they're all like 17, 18, 19. Uh, and, and I was in music production at the time, uh, you know, and he was like, well, can, can you guys come and maybe be music mentors and just be a part of these guys' lives? Wow. And so here I am supposed to be the mentor changing <laughs> their lives. And what's right. really happening is they're upstreaming me. Yeah. They're teaching me oh. things that I needed to know. Concepts that I had in my mind, concepts that I had in my heart. But all of a sudden I started building relationship. That chasm that was between us because we were different from each other all of a sudden began to close because we were creating together. Mm -hmm. we, we were, and in some cases we were traveling together and going on tour together. And these young people who were former gang members yeah. had created, I mean, they had done some violent crimes, you know, yeah. they had been in and out of jail. If they were adults, they would have been in prison, but, but, but they were, you know, getting a path through the juvenile justice system to kind of come out of their scenario yeah. and learning their story of why they were in the situations they were. And here's a really interesting point to make, Chris, is a lot of people think that human trafficking is about the 13 year old girl who's vulnerable and gets trafficked. Yeah. And, and, and we talked about there are push factors in that person's life that kind of push them into vulnerability that maybe that young person can't control. What I learned was, well, the same way that a young girl was being groomed to be a victim of human trafficking, these young guys were being groomed to be gangbangers. They were being groomed to be exploiters. They were being yeah. groomed to be victimizers. And, and all of a sudden, it all began to click. And then here's the pivoting phrase that I always tell people. Those young people, when, they, when I became friends with them, and they showed me their story and I understood their backstory and how they got to where they were. All of a sudden I went from an artist who happened to be an activist and care about activism to a full-time activist who happened to be an artist. Yeah. I switched it and just made my life about that and mm. learned that the arts was a way that I could pull people into the conversation uh, and, and, and to give people a path to engage. Yeah. Dude, I love that. I love, and I love how you're seeing both sides of that. You know, one of the interesting things that, one of the most interesting things I heard on the most recent um, interview that we did on this issue was this guy was describing how he, he experienced a new level of breakthrough in what he was doing 
as soon as he learned how to actually like love the oppressor. Um, you know, and so when you're talking about these young men and you're seeing them being groomed, you know, and you're starting to learn their story, you're really starting to, and it was actually, I don't know, I forget, he was an abolitionist, um, you know, and he did this whole thing on actually like, what was even worse than being a slave was the rot that was happening in the slave owner spirit. You know, and he, he went in and he described how like broken a person has to be to do this stuff, you know, and to like, you know, he was talking about that really the person who was in chain was the oppressor, you know? And so I just think this is such an interesting angle and the kind of work that you guys are doing to really be able to understand the kind of person that's willing to exploit to this degree, you know? And Well, and I mean, hurt people hurt people. Totally. And, and we find people who've been victimized often come back into the circle and become a victimizer. Yeah. And we see that cycle happen a lot. Um, and so I think it is kind of one big issue together. You've got these people who are the puppet masters and they're very broken, but they're, bro you know, but there are a lot of people who are broken and who, and who have, who, who have experienced victimization, who choose not to be a victimizer. Totally. The totally. difference is the victim doesn't choose it, yeah. but the victimizer does choose it. And yeah. so you got to be careful to, to, to delineate and separate that. Totally. Totally. So is, is most of the work that uh, I empathize is doing right now, is it US based or is it, is it outside of the US? And like, just from a geography standpoint, where are you guys mostly? Yeah. Um, you know, so, so big picture is, you know, we're focusing on, on communities in general where young people are, are most vulnerable. Okay. We're also focusing on adult sectors and, and it, it, that are out there who are more likely to intersect with vulnerable youth. Yeah. We've done work in, in Eastern Europe. We partnered with projects in Russia. We partnered with projects in Southeast Asia. We've, we partnered with pro projects in Africa. We partnered with projects in, in, in Mexico and Central yeah. America. We have footprint everywhere but our primary focus is on the United States. Okay. Um, we do try to create material that can transcend just the U.S. and connect yeah. to others, and we do a lot of work on some Spanish stuff as well. So that's yeah, awesome. we're, well, that's, we're global, but we base out of here. Yeah, that's actually really good because I, I feel like, you know, this is what I really want to talk about today and focus in on because I feel like when I hear most people talk about human trafficking, it's – it's kind of like with the idea, well, that happens over there, meaning Thailand yeah. or, or, you know, Eastern Europe or Russia or Asia somewhere that's, or South America, that's not an issue that we have here, you know? And so, and I'm always like, no, that's totally not, not true. But I would love for you just to kind of talk about, you know, what, what does it look like here? How does it happen? I mean, I feel like yeah. I mean, you would, I, I know that you guys are doing a big truck stop push. I'd love to hear about that project and just kind of help educate our audience on what, human trafficking in the U.S. looks like? Yeah, well, I think it's, again, it's about vulnerable populations. Exploiters try to figure out where those vulnerable populations are. And so in every city, you, you, you have that. You have, you have a concentrated area of vulnerabilities in certain communities, and then you have the internet. Now you have the ability for an exploiter to get into the hand and to, into the lives of young people through their devices or through their gaming or their social media, you know, whatever that might be. So, so that's a space. So yeah. you have kind of these digital neighborhoods where okay. you have a safe place to hang out mm -hmm. and then you have a bad alley to go down. Yeah. And, and so you, you see tactics of traffickers trying to exploit vulnerabilities through an online context. Yeah. Then you have all of that in person. Yeah. And so that, that can just change. It's, it looks a certain way in Denver. It looks, a, it looks a different way in, in, in Las Vegas. It looks a little different in Sacramento. It looks a little different in Orlando, Florida. And sometimes you have cities that cater to more of a, a, a atmosphere that, that traffickers can prey upon, like a Las Vegas or like a city with tourism or like cities that have big sporting events. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually had an issue in North Dakota where we did a bunch of expose media when there was the oil boom that was happening up there where you had 40,000 men descend upon Williston, North Dakota, a town of like 10, 12,000 people. And so you have this high ratio sex imbalance of, of male to female wow. and traffickers were making more money off their victims in Williston, North Dakota on a daily basis than they were 
uh, in in Las Vegas and that they were at the Super Bowl. So yeah, traffickers awesome. learn where those situations are and they and they exploit those scenarios. Yeah. And so what does that look like? Are these girls coming? Are they U.S. girls? Are they international? I mean, it's I, I, uh, it depends. It, it, it depends on the market of what everybody's looking at, you know, that they want to like, you know, that they're commodifying the, these young people or these victims. So if you're on Wall Street uh, in New York City, yeah. uh, it's not going to look the same. What it might look like is, well, what do investors do five or six o'clock to blow off steam or 10 o'clock at night? They're probably going to go more to like a strip club. Yeah. And in Manhattan, you'll see a lot of trafficking victims that are maybe international, you know, model jobs that were being offered to them. Yeah. And now all of a sudden they're in a trafficking scenario in New York City. That's it crazy. could look different in Houston yeah. um, and, and, in, and in Miami. And, mm -hmm. you know, you see a lot of nationalities from those ports that are near. You'll see some Asian exploitation coming in from the West Coast in yeah. Seattle and, and Toronto. I mean, uh, 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 Portland and Seattle yeah. and Vancouver mm -hmm. in San Francisco you'll see uh, a lot of trafficking come up into Texas and Arizona and New Mexico and in California from Mexico and and then from the Caribbean into Miami and then from Eastern Europe in through Canada or in through the East Coast ports so you got some of that then you have the interior of the United States and you you, you, you see a lot of exploitation of, of, of local young people yeah. Uh, who, who are there. And then you see highways and, and highway systems. So there'll be a network where they'll keep their victims moving. Maybe it's more like Pennsylvania and Ohio, and they've got a whole network there. And then in Denver, you've got, you know, uh, your, your I-70, I-25 corridor. So it'll converge into Denver because there's not a lot of cities around Denver. And yeah. so you, you see it in all different ways. But if you're looking at like the raids and the stings that are happening in the United States, by the FBI and by law enforcement, and you're seeing the numbers of like, oh, there were 150 kids recovered in yeah. one year from Denver. There were 250 kids recovered in Chicago. You know, when you start seeing that, most of those are our are, are, are own kiddos from the United States and from our local communities. A lot of kids are in foster care or runaway. Something has pushed them out of their home where they don't feel safe there. And then somebody's out there wherever those young people are hanging for uh, uh, to just survive and taking advantage of that. We've had traffic facilities where young people uh, are, are in centers of some kind and they're actually recruiting outside of schools. You know, I mean, it just really is about a trafficker seeing where a vulnerability opportunity is and preying on that. And if they can see it, we can see it. Yeah. Okay. So. And let me just kind of back up and dig in this a little bit more. And so primarily when it, when it happens in America, you're saying it's typically through foster care. It's a runaway. Do you see, is this something that you see family members doing or is that less? Yeah. It, it's all. Yeah. A trafficker can be, can really be anyone, you know, and we, we, we see this happen where it's oftentimes someone that knows that young person. Okay. Um, or that victim, you know, there's some kind of bridge where they build it, built some trust yep. and to really exploit somebody at this kind of level mm -hmm. and to break them down to a point where you can control them with invisible chains yep. and they will do what you say. Um, oftentimes it's about getting to know this person and then using that knowledge of getting to know them against them. So yep. sometimes you'll see that in the form of all kinds of disguises. Uh, you'll see a, an exploiter pretend to be something that they see that that vulnerable youth needs. So if that, if that, if that kid's missing a father figure, they'll become a father figure or a mother figure. They'll become a mother figure or a sister brotherhood. They'll become that. They'll kind of morph into what that person needs and pretend to be that to wow. build trust. Mm -hmm. Then they'll find out details. Oh, well, where do you live and what matters to that young person? Once they start to find out what matters to that young person, they'll start to collect that data. And sometimes they'll go, oh, you know, we know the address of where your mom lives. That's, you've told us that's the only person you care about in life. And if you don't do what we say, it'll be this. Uh -huh. Sometimes it's survival sex. It's somebody yeah. who's going, you need something like just, you know, shelter tonight or food yeah. tonight. And they'll exploit that and say, you know, I'll provide this for you, but you owe this. Sometimes it's a boyfriend, girlfriend type pimping situation or exploiting situation. And they'll get them to fall in love with them. 
And then all of a sudden they'll use that as their tactic. You know, sometimes they'll take compromising pictures once they get into an intimate relationship with that person. And then they'll say, hey, I'm going to blitz this out to everyone if you don't do what I say. There are so many twisted tactics that traffickers use and they customize it to their victim. Okay. Um, that's crazy. Okay. So then let's just go back to this North Dakota scenario for again. How, how do they get those girls out there? Is that primarily, are they doing that for the trucking industry? Um, um, not necessarily. In the North Dakota situation, uh, it, it, it was really more, uh, I'll just give you an example of uh, the person that, the, the survivor who was featured in, in this program with us to reach out to, to, to the oil industry. Yeah. You know, she basically had two kids. She was in her early 20s. Uh, and, and her trafficker became at one time her boyfriend and then eventually got the kids separated from her and then used that as the way to exploit her. And because her, and, and he was basing out of Las Vegas and he knew that he could make more money off of her in Williston, North Dakota than he could. He would literally send her and two or three other of his victims to North Dakota and he had he had ways to make sure that they would come back and he wouldn't even go with them. The wow. bond, the bondage that he had them in, they would get on a train, an Amtrak train, because you didn't have to check your bags. Nobody looked at your stuff. And it's different than an air airplane. And so they would take Amtrak up there. They would get off. They would actually have people that were up there waiting for them. They had hotels kind of set up. There was a whole system set up to where they could come and exploit these uh, women and we we would see traffickers coming in to North Dakota, bringing them from St. Paul, Minnesota, with that same tactic from Las Vegas, from Chicago, and all of that would really manifest itself in the hotels, in the bars, and even at times just taking girls to man camps where men were living like in the equivalent of army barracks, you know, for three weeks away from their family. So uh, any way that they could get into that that community without being noticed too much yeah. or, or hiding it under the guise of prostitution and saying, well, they're just prostitutes. They're, you know, they're here, uh, you know, whatever they're doing, they're, they're addicted to something It's them. And they would hide the exploitation of the pimp behind that to kind of disguise that from buyers up there. Wow. And, and it was all about a deception and the, the coercive techniques that traffickers use on their victims are so strong that even when they're miles and miles away from their victimizer, they're still being controlled by that person. Dude, that's crazy because when I, when I was reading even some of the work that you guys do specifically with the truck stuff, which we'll talk about in a second here, I w I'm envisioning, you know, someone who's got these girls in his cab and it's shady. And, you know, if there was a way that they could get free, that they would. But this is just like a totally different level where you're describing that the oppressor isn't even there. Yeah. Able to be states away and they're still just doing, doing this. what that's, they're told. That's crazy to me. Um, they have quotas. And if they don't meet their quotas and you know, like you, you need to make a thousand dollars a night. I don't care how you make it, but you got to make it. So that's seven grand a week. You're up there for two weeks. If you don't come back with 14, $15,000 minimum. And if, and if the other, a victim that I sent up there comes back with more money than you do, the consequences start to kick in. Wow. So there's this constant obsession that every day I have to make this quota or there's going to be some consequence that's disastrous for somebody I care about. Yeah. Do you think, do you think the, the men on the other side of this understand this? Do you think that they're just prostitutes? Do you think? It, it, it depends. In some cases, yes. A hundred percent. The men know what's going on. They're apathetic to it. They, they pay to not know the backstory. Yeah. You know, that's happening. And it's blatant and, yeah. and it's disgusting. There are other situations where men are alone and, they, and maybe, they're, maybe they haven't been away from their family for a few weeks. That's why you see a lot of red light districts where army bases are yeah. because it, it's really uh, traffickers know that exploitation I can take advantage of someone's loneliness. I can take advantage of them being away. I can, they're tired. They're yeah. having a few drinks. And mm -hmm. so there are situations where men find themselves kind of in a trap they weren't expecting to be in. Maybe right. even the day, that day, they, they would have no idea that they would have done that, but something about the scenario, they did it. So, you know, it, none of it is right. 
Yeah. Uh, but there's different ways of uh, traffickers not only using tactics to deceive and prey upon uh, their victims, but also to deceive and prey upon a scenario where there might be a group of buyers. So yeah. you have a lot of men complicit in it. You have a lot of men who are apathetic and don't care, who have this kind of toxic mentality of manhood, mm -hmm. and they, don't, they just don't care. Uh, and then you have others who feel trapped and tricked. Then you have like the fact that a 12-year-old boy in the United States sees tens of thousands of images objectifying a woman without even touching pornography, just in video games and ads and TV. And you've got this 12-year-old kind of being groomed to be a buyer. Yeah. you know, in the future. So you got a lot of things at work here that are just very complex. That's, that's crazy, dude. Um, that's so, so fascinating. That's, I'm just learning a ton just hearing you talk. Yeah, we're drinking from the fire hose. Right yeah, now. no, dude, that's exactly <laughs> what I wanted, dude. So, so then tell me this, like, you know, tell me, talk to me about the, the truck program that you guys have. Um, what's some of the work that you guys are doing in the U.S. to, to yeah, yeah. kind of, you know, combat this issue. Yeah, uh, well, and I'll, I'll start before the trucking program. I'll say our, our priority is prevention. We want to stop exploitation before it starts. Yeah. So, so, so what we prioritize are our programs that go into schools and into youth serving spaces. Mm -hmm. We partner with, with both uh, uh, guys and gals who have survived all kinds of crazy stuff. And they're they're giving advice as 19, 20, 21 year olds back to 12 year olds in all of our media curriculum. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we basically say, okay, here's the issue. Here's, here's, here's a person who's experienced it, who's in a state uh, of their life of recovery that they're ready to help others not experience it. Yeah. And so we work really hard to find the right person to give advice back to those young people. Once we do that, we then create a team of educational psychologists, counselors, therapists, and we all come together and build a safe curriculum that helps young people through other peers understand what it means to be vulnerable, what it means to be pushed into vulnerability, what it means to have people who try to take advantage of you. And if somebody's pretending to be awesome in your life, but they're, they're awful, how do you trust someone who's really awesome in your life? And we give young people a safety plan to be able to, in advance, know that if I'm ever in an exploitive situation, here's my safety plan. Here's what it looks like. I can identify it. I can feel the vibe coming at me. I know when, it's, when someone I shouldn't be trusting is coming and they're like, you know, disguising them, someone that's helpful. And then I can have, I know my two or three people I can go to to reach out to when that moment happens. And we've got some really cool ways of how we do that. And, yeah. and, and we're, in, we're in, I think, over 30 states now, L LA Unified yeah, you're, School you're District, mad, all of that. Online, it, seemed, it was right around 30 states, it looked like. So that, that's yeah, what, yeah, yeah. And it's growing all the time. And yeah. you know, all new schools are coming on. We've got some really cool stuff happening with schools. So that's, that's our priority. But then you've got this adult sector. Now, adults that work with youth over here are social workers, teachers. You know, those are no-brainers. We yeah. know that it's their job to help keep young people safe and to work with young people. Mm -hmm. So if it's their job to already do that, we don't need to do it for them. We just need to give them tools to do it better. Totally. So that's how we do that with youth. Mm -hmm. Now I want you to think about that in the form of identification. Mm -hmm. So truckers, one good example. In the normal rhythm of a truck driver's life, it is their job every day to get on the road, to keep their eyes on the road, to be aware of traffic around them, to be safe as they drive, to be, you know, that everyone around them is safe. And, and they're conscious of that. They're always aware of their surroundings. Mm -hmm. When we first started reaching out to the trucking industry, people were like, oh, good job. Way to go after the bad guys. It's like, no, 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 no. We're not yeah. going after the trucking industry because they're the bad guys. Right. Here's what's cool. Guess how many truck drivers are on the road in the United States today, Chris? 30 million, 15 million. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's in the millions, right? It's not that big, but <laughs> okay. most, most people don't have an idea, but it's, it's 3 million truck drivers on okay. the road today. Right. Ish, ish, ish. Yeah. So, so they're really an army of eyes cool. and ears yeah. who are in spaces every day seeing things that we don't see. Yeah. So think about all the different industries that are similar to that. Mm -hmm. And if they could be equipped to just to be able to 
to, to recognize and safely respond, even just reporting that they saw a human trafficking case on a truck lot or when they were delivering to a casino or whatever it might be, uh, then, then if they can do that and we can, and we can create a program that actually motivates them and moves them, and that's why we use artists. Because when we create our documentary training films, mm -hmm. they are cinematic, they, 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 they authenticate the issue, they, they have experts, mm -hmm. people that it's happened to, and people who work on this issue, who communicate in that space. And every training film that we make to train a sector, we reproduce the media in their space, partnering with them so that they feel it's theirs, so that they see it as their own cause, their own issue. And because we do that, we've seen amazing success. UPS drivers now have to watch an I Empathize film to be a UPS driver. Oh, In wait. multiple states, wow. you have to get your CDL. You have to watch an I Empathize film just to get your CDL. And it's we do crazy. that through our partnership with the nonprofit truckers against trafficking that's okay. a separate nonprofit from us but there are they're like our distribution partner yeah. they build the relationships we partner with them to build the material and then we're, we're now doing that with multiple sectors hotels okay. casinos um, with law enforcement with hosp hospitals with first responders wow. just those groups that you think oh that's a no-brainer they're gonna totally. see things we won't they're just moving through the streets all the time or they're at a location where they're gonna see yeah. this awesome um, did you have any pushback in the trucking industry? Was that we did in the very beginning when we started it? You know, people in the trucking industry kind of knew that there was some criminal activity that was being preyed upon on their industries, and and they they hated it. No, nobody in the trucking industry wanted that to happen. Yeah. And at first, it was like, well, if we acknowledge that human trafficking might be happening on a truck lot, or that our drivers might be targeted by traffickers then then you know that's bad pr for us yeah and and there was a couple brave ceos in the early days who went wait a minute let's think about this differently totally. if it's our job to say you know what we don't want crimes happening against any of our employees or any of our patrons of our companies um and we take that as a as a hard stand then why wouldn't we add this Right. to that mix of a list of things that we care about totally. and you started to see a few ceos that went no this is a good thing to communicate that this is the safest truck lot you could possibly be at because we're so proactive and right. once that happened it was like a domino effect wow. it took a lot of time and it took a lot of persistence by the team over at truckers against trafficking to make it happen and then it took us building materials that didn't polarize people and call them out but invited them into the conversation to be a yeah. part of the answer so there's a lot of work to get it to that place oh, yeah. but basically once we got it there and people saw the good that was happening yeah. and truckers started reporting and rescue started happening then yeah. everybody got excited to say let's be an army to fight this issue and now they're everyday heroes driving their vehicles totally. yet every day they're out there being a hero for us that's so and then you replicate that sector by sector yeah wow dude that's incredible so what about this? Do you see, are you involved at all um, with like any governmental stuff in the U.S.? Do you, do you have like, yeah. is there any conversation that's happening there at that level that's interesting? Yeah, of course, all the time. I mean, yeah. you know, we really, you, you know, some people say we're going to end human trafficking in our lifetime. Okay, I like, I like, how, I like where you're at with that. I like where your head's at. Totally. Um, and I like the idea of we're going to end it in this person and in this person and this person's life. I think all that's real. But we kind of have to accept the fact that no matter what happens in any city, in any government, in any set of legislation that's out there, uh, we have to accept the fact that there's always going to be bad guys. So we do have to create a way to suppress and punish mm -hmm. those activities. We've got to make it very difficult to be a trafficker. We've got to make it really hard to yeah. exploit our kids. Totally. So you can't do that unless you give law enforcement and judicial systems the tools to make it miserable mm -hmm. for you to be a trafficker mm -hmm. so so you have to get that done so i think the entire tribe and community in the human rights world who are fighting exploitation in its many forms are all of us mm -hmm. are working on policies all of us are working on and some of those are, are federal policies some of those are state policies some of those are laws some of those are just creating uh like for example right now in florida you know a lot of the abolitionists and activists down there have pushed enough to be able to go hey 
we're going to make it mandatory in our state that if you have a hotel that you train all your employees on what to look for and how to respond to it. You know, and so you're starting to see that happen. In, in several states, it's now a law that schools have to teach prevention of exploitation. So, so those are things that, that activists have leveraged and yeah. that all of us have been a voice and being a part of. And then we come in and we adapt our tools to fit the leveraging of those policies so they actually be used. So there's a lot of strategy at that level that, that okay. we're all using. That's awesome, dude. So, you know, I don't know if you know anything about this. Um, you know, you're in California now. There was that whole thing that was passed, what was it, last month by Newsom about the lowering the age of consent for, yeah. uh, for do you know anything about that? I, I just barely know. I, I basically know what I just said there, but I don't know a ton about what that law means or, you know, what's, does Reason it happen? why they were doing it? Yeah. Well, or, they, there was some unintended consequences that were coming with it. In some of those policies, they're, they're looking immediately to protect certain group of kids mm -hmm. uh, with a certain demographic. And then they're hurting another group of kids by doing, you know, so, yeah. so sometimes people have good intentions and then they don't understand the unintended consequences of that policy. Yeah, yeah. And you got to kind of like evolve. Totally. Totally. Well, so tell me, tell me this, this has been great. What's like, is there any aspect of what you're doing right now that you're just like super discouraged by <laughs> that you're just like, man, I mean, I, we could just, I'm, I'm, I'm always discouraged. Yeah. I'm always frustrated. I'm always mad. I'm always pissed off about this stuff. I'm always angry about it. It's, it's my fuel that drives me. Yeah. Um, I love justice. Yeah. Which means I hate injustice. <laughs> totally. So, so, so that, that, so some people though will say, man, these are heinous crimes and issues. How do you not get burned out? Yeah. How do you, um, how, you know, how do you sleep at night? And the truth is what makes me that I'm doing something. Yeah. And I don't have to be doing something, you know, radical as a person. I can just do my slice. Mm -hmm. But knowing that you're doing something offsets the truth that it's happening. And if we look away from the problem, it doesn't mean the problem goes away. Yeah. So that's worse to me. What's better to me is like looking at it and knowing that we're going to, we're going to rally people to do it. So yeah. that work is always frustrating. Mm -hmm. It's always slow as molasses. <laughs> we, you know, we're a nonprofit, you, you know, we don't, we're not selling things that people want to buy. So, you know, we're not like flush with cash really? and you know, that's, that's a difficult thing for our entire team and, and, and anybody who's working on these kinds of issues. So I think anybody who works in this kind of space, all live with a constant frustration that in some way motivates us to keep, to keep going. Totally dude. Yeah. So then the flip side, then what's something out there that like, you're like, man, this is just what's giving me hope right now. Or like, <laughs> yeah, dude. Well, that's the other side of it, man. Cause you just, you know, like seeing people rise up, the good guys always outnumber the bad guys. So if we can understand that issue and we can empower the good people in our community, if traffickers can go find vulnerabilities in our community and prey upon them and create sophisticated networks of exploitation, then we who outnumber them and are smarter than them can also identify where those vulnerable kids are, create a network of support that combats that. Yeah. And when we see that actually happening in a community, it fires me up, Chris. Like, That's awesome. Like nothing else. Yeah, I love that, dude. Well, okay, so tell our viewers then, um, where can they find you online? Like, what can they check out? Obviously, I, I empathize.org, um, yeah. your website. What's like, what's your Facebook? What's some other things that they can do to check yeah, out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just can, you can, I mean, we, we have a Facebook, I empathize. We have an Instagram, I empathize. Those are kind of our two social media. We're a small, small team. So, you know, we're, we, 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 we spend time partnering with many other people like yourself. So we're only a team of about, you know, five, six people. Yeah. So, so we, we relegate our work to collaboration and partnerships. Yep. Uh, we, we, we relegate our work to community distribution. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get involved in I Empathize and you want to make a difference in your community, we don't work in your community without you. Yeah. So, that's so you, if you're a school teacher or you, are, you work with youth, or you're a Boys and Girls Club, or you're, you're, a, you're, you're a part of your faith community, and you, you're serving youth in some way, we have programs to help you keep your youth safe, and you should be using them. Yeah. Second of all, we are releasing just 
coming out this next month in beta, but it'll all come out in January for the full mass public. But if you want to get involved with us and you're an adult who's not a teacher or a social worker or a probation officer, we want to partner with you. We're building what's called the Intersect Response Platform. Wow. And if you're a parent, if you're a foster parent, mm -hmm. if you are law enforcement, if you are a first responder, if you are in transportation, if you work in, the, in, in, in a hotel, if you work in uh, a hospital, uh, and then we have several other sectors. We actually have labor trafficking as well, courses. We have all this library. It's like a school of justice. And you can go and you can be trained just like we've trained the truck drivers for the last eight years. We're taking the success of those programs and replicating it into many sectors where you can do just what the truck drivers are doing. Wow. You can do that in your own space. And uh, we have a beautiful system of how that's going to work out. And, and it's easy for you to implement. So just is contact like us. App or what is you going? Is that like an app or what is it? It, it, it's it's training that can be done in person. So okay. we have a lot of people who like maybe maybe they're uh, uh, maybe someone who's watching works for their fire department, and they can say to their fire chief, "Hey, the next time we do a group training, can we include this in our training?" Wow. But we also it's also just an online school, okay. and and so okay. if you're a company, you get your own registration. And you can come into our learning platform, and at that point, all your company employees get registered. You can see them move the needle on their education, and then uh, and all that reporting and, and, and data is, is added into that. And they're just online courses that are movie-based, very ADD-friendly. Watch a five-minute video, answer two or three questions, watch yeah. another very cool five-minute video answer a few questions, and before you know it, you understand the issue and you know what to do. That's so awesome, dude. I love it. Um, well, Brad, that's perfect, dude. I, uh, you know, I encourage everyone who's listening to this, check out I Empathize. They do amazing work. Um, Brad, thank you so much for taking the time and educating us today. Dude, this has been amazing. Awesome, dude. Love it. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for adding your voice. Thank you for giving a platform to this issue. And uh, we just love that. We're not going to change it without stuff like this happening. So thank you for sharing your, your, your uh, platform. We love it. We love it.